Blackbird, hitting those dishes with everything she has. She's consistently diving in the bottom of the dark and greasy water to search for knives and forks. Dishwater splashing around terrific rate all over Mrs. Drudge. That rubber apron isn't much help now. She's splashing so hard it's getting all over me, and it's a little dangerous attempt to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of what's going on in that dishpan. There's a lot of action over here. She's mopping up with a towel to get the water some of the dishes she dried a few minutes ago. That water in the pan is an awful messy-looking sight, folks. I wish you could see it. Incidentally, in the entire operation, the dishwasher would use a total of only 15 quarts of water, which is a lot less than Mrs. Drudge's use. And now over here, Mrs. Drudge... Mrs. Drudge washes dishes just like Tom. Nonsense. It takes him an hour to wash a plate. The heated dishes. Then he usually drops. You mean he gets more water on the floor than on the dishes. That's why I never let him help me anymore. Now I know he's smarter than you. Mrs. Drudge, come on, please. Hurry, Mrs. Drudge, before it's too late. That water's coming out very fast. Too late. There's the last drop of water, folks. The contest is over in exactly seven minutes and 58 seconds. In that time, Mrs. Martin has washed 50 dishes and 40 pieces of silverware. As I... Well, it's all over, Mrs. Drudge. You may as well rest now. <laughs> as I said before, ladies and gentlemen, this contest is going to be scored on three counts. First, the time it takes to do the dishes. Unquestionably, Mrs. Martin wins on that score. Second, the cleanliness of the dishes. They are clean, they are dry and sparkling. They do honor to any woman's table, so Mrs. Martin wins point number two. Her dishes are certainly cleaner. And now, point number three, the condition of the contestants. Mrs. Martin looks as fresh and neat as when she stepped into the ring. While Mrs. Drudge, well, I'll have to leave that to you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the winner, Mrs. Martin. I'm tired just from what that announcer said. Did you hear him, Mother? In 15 years, a woman washes, dries, and stacks a pile of dishes nine times higher than the Empire State Building. Imagine it. Well, that didn't impress me half as much as seeing Mrs. Modern read a paper while her dishes were being washed. <laughs> She'll look young when she's 100. <laughs> Hi, Babs. Shake hands with an old pal of yours. Why, Jim. Babs. How are you? It's nice to see you again. You're looking well. As usual. Oh, this is Mr. Makarov, my art teacher. Nick, this is Jim Treadway, one of the hometown boys. We're glad to know you, Mr. Makarov. How are you? And this is my little brother, Makarov. Hello. Oh, say, Babs, we're on our way to the Hall of Power. Why don't you tag along and learn something? Well, there's plenty of time before we meet the folks. I don't know, it might be fun. What do you think, Nick? All right, but don't expect me to be amused. There's nothing funny about the tools of capitalism. She make ribbons, seven at a time, ain't it, honey? You'd be nearer right if you called it a Frankenstein's monster. No, that's in the movies. Why do you call it that, Nick? Machines like this destroy jobs. Think of the number of people who'd be working if we didn't have these power looms. Yes. I guess every woman in America would be weaving, and every home would be a sweatshop producing clothes for the family, like they were before we had power looms. I don't think I'd like that very much. I don't think you'd like homespun clothes either. Grandma tells me they didn't have much style, but they cost so much in hard labor, you wore them till they fell apart. That's what the Cossacks do in Russia. Every couple of years, they peel off their duds like stick and plaster. It might interest you to know that only the peasants do that. Not here, they don't. We ain't got any. But you didn't answer Nick's question. I mean, about looms like this keeping people out of work. A fellow with a red beard asked me the same thing the other day. He waited while I looked it up. And there were four textile mills in America in 1800. They employed a few hundred workers and used water power. Today, with electric and other power, around a million persons are employed in the textile industry. And clothes are so cheap, no one has to make his own. That, I think, answers your question. What's over here, Jim? What is it, Jim? Look at that thing go around. It's a manipulator table using a steel blooming mill. You can control the billet with these switches. Watch out, it's going off. Oh. The photoelectric equipment keeps it on the table. I suppose you're going to tell us machines like this benefit labor. And how. 
Not many years ago, steel making was a dangerous occupation. Now, the safest place a steel man can be is in the mill. It's safer than his home. That's right, capitalistic propaganda. Oh, you're kidding, Jim. I'm stating a fact. I know one steel plant that employs 10,000 men. While 15 of them lost their lives at home and other places, not one was lost in the steelworks. That's hard to believe. Well, there's the answer right there. Electrical control. Instead of swinging a sledgehammer all day and risking his neck, the steel man sits where Bud is and does his work with the master switches. Well, if one man can do all that with a machine, then I agree with Nick. It can't help but lessen jobs. Here's why they don't, Babs. It's very simple. Machine production makes better and cheaper products. As a result, more people want and can buy them. That in turn creates a demand for more labor. That's just one of those so-called economic laws that doesn't work in practice. It works in steel, printing, textiles, and automobiles, and they're the most mechanized industries in the country. Yes. Uh, let's go see what's over here, Nick. Uh -oh. hey, you can operate that yourself, bud. Oh, thanks. Step on the dead man's pedal here, or keep it down always with the other. You step on the right pedal, and you stop and shoot. That's your brake. This is your gong. Does your company make any really large equipment, Mr. Treadway? Yes, they do. Some so big, it has to be shipped piece by piece. For example, an electric furnace we made for a large motor company is 330 feet long. I thought so. Those are the kind of machines that displace men. Mass market industries don't modernize to save jobs, Mr. Makarov. Their aim is to increase production. That's how employment is created. The only way, in fact. General statements don't mean much to me, Mr. Treadway. All right, thanks, then. I know in one year these people spent nine millions for what you call the labor-saving machinery. That same year, they increased their payroll by 40,000 men and 88 million dollars. Funny how a guy with facts can break up an argument. <laughs> I suppose you think that's funny. Oh, so you can't take it, huh? Don't you think we'd better look up for folks? It must be nearly time for lunch. Yes, I guess you're right. They'll probably be looking for us. Come on, Dad. Okay. Nick, please be careful during lunch. Dad looks on things the same way Jim does, and he might take you seriously. But I am serious. I know, but promise me that you won't start an argument. All right, if you say so. But I won't enjoy myself. And please come early. Then we can have a chance for a nice long talk. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to come. Sorry I have to break away now, but I must get back to school. Au revoir. Goodbye, Mr. McElroy. I enjoyed meeting you all. Sorry, but I must go. Au revoir. Goodbye. Goodbye. So Thanks. Oh, boy, was that a meal. I could go for chow like that all the time. <laughs> you do, and you'll wind up on a sideshow. <laughs> <laughs> well, did I behave all right? You were fine. Only don't misinterpret Dad's approval of Karl Marx. He thought you were talking about relatives of Groucho and Harpo. I... I don't believe I know them. Well, I'll see you in class, Babs. Adios, linda mia. Now, I won't take no for an answer. You're coming to dinner, too, and like it. Hey, Jim, how about showing Dad the Hall of Science? He'll go for that. I'd be glad to, bud. Fine. How about you, Mrs. Harrison? Would you care to join us? No, thank you. I want to show Jane and Barbara some of the things in the Hall of Electrical Living. Well, say, Electro, the motor man, will be doing his tricks at 2 o'clock. Let's meet there. All right. Come on, Jane. Barbara. what I call smart. Making time the theme of the home exhibits. I don't get it. What's smart about it? Well, if there was one thing a woman in my day never had enough of, it was time. It was her master. Some had two, if they had a bossy husband. <laughs> don't tell me you're against her, Mom. No, indeed. Only against slavery. <laughs> Domestic or otherwise. That's why I like electrical engineers. They signed our Emancipation Proclamation. Beautiful kitchen. 
nothing. It's a paradise. No one who hasn't cooked over a wood stove by the light of a kerosene lamp can really appreciate what it all means. The steps, it would say. The good old days, eh, Grandma? Yes, and anybody who wants them can have my share. This is the new electric dishwasher. That's key. Bud and Dad would sure go for it. They're the official dish dryers. Tom's going to get me a dishwasher like that for my birthday. It's the last thing he ever does. But, Mother, your birthday was last month. Well, I've just decided I'm going to have another. <laughs> this is nice. And very modern. Masculine, too. Miss, is that a three-way floor lamp? Yes, madam. You should show Nick these rooms, Barbara. It's a subtle way to set his feet in the right path. Well, what do you mean, Grandma? Well, even artists have to live, so there's no harm in showing them how you'd like to do it. Oh, that's old-fashioned. There are more important things today than homemaking. Maybe, but I don't know what they are. I always figured raising my family and keeping your grandfather well-fed and happy was pretty important. So did he. But Nick's different. He wouldn't care if he fed him sawdust. He just isn't interested in such things. He put away a mighty good lunch for a fellow who doesn't care. But he doesn't care, really. He's an idealist. You should hear him in class. He talks more about Aristotle than he does all. Did he tell you how Aristotle got the time to be a philosopher? No, I don't believe he did. Well, he talked the richest woman in all Greece into marrying him. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with a great deal of pride and pleasure, I present to you Electro, the Westinghouse Moto Man. Electro, come here. And here he comes, ladies and gentlemen, walking up to greet you under his own power. Stop. You see, all I need to do is to speak into this phone, and Electro does exactly what I tell him to do, sometimes. But I don't see why I'm telling Electro's story when he's perfectly able to tell his own. So let's listen and see what Electro has to say to us today. All right, Electro, will you tell your story, please? Who? Me? Yes, you. Okay, toots. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be very glad to tell my story. I am a smart fellow, as I have a very fine brain of 48 electrical relays. It works just like a telephone switchboard. If I get a wrong number, I can always blame the operator. Thank you. And by the way, I see a lot of good numbers out in our audience today. Electro, behave yourself. Quiet, please. I'm doing the talking. I'm sorry. That's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. Boy, what a guard that guy'd make on my football team. <laughs> now, Electro, a moment ago, you were bragging about uh, being able to count on your fingers. Do you remember that? Well, we're going to find out about that. Now, uh, do you remember how many children were born at the same time to a certain family up in Canada? Do you remember that? All right, let's see if you do. Count them on your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. Five? Well, that's absolutely correct. Why, well, he's almost human. If he wasn't so big, I'd take him for an engineer. All right, now, Electro, I know you enjoy these, and I'm really going to try to give you a nice pleasure out of these. So here you are. You got that? Now, hold on to it. You may now smoke this cigarette. Go on 
Oh, yes, Electro. You do need a light, too, don't you? All right, here you are. And, folks, he's only two years old, too. Just learning. How can he do all those things, Jim? He's full of motors, gears, cabs, and photoelectric cells. You could fill a book with all the electromechanical principles involved in the thing. All he lacks is a heart and a brain. If you ask me, I'd say he had nothing but brains. Well, then, all he lacks is a heart. He's not the only one. What's an eight-letter word for a gusty wind in Patagonia? Begins with W. Have a hot grandma. How can I write a price winning letter with you asking about wind and things? Oh, I'm sorry, bud. I won't do it again. Well, that's all right. I'll give you a lift when I finish this. If I ever do. See, Jim, what had happened if all the things Westinghouse developed first just disappeared? Well, suddenly, I mean. Well, it's easy. There'd be no electrical industry. It'll put the world back 50 years. Why do you ask? Well, I figured all the others would write about what they saw at the fair. So if I tell them what wouldn't be there without Westinghouse, I won't have any competition. You've got something there, bud. Go to it. Hey, wait a minute, Jim. I need some facts. All right. Just consider three out of the thousands of things we pioneered and where we'd be without them. Oh, just a second. All right, go ahead. Uh, first, alternating current, or AC as most people call it. It permits the economical sending of electric power long distances from where it's generated. Second, uh, the steam turbines for use in the big power stations where electricity is made. And third, radio broadcasting. The Westinghouse station KDKA at Pittsburgh was the first to broadcast programs on a regular schedule. Do you think those are enough? Well. We make over 8,000 other products you could mention. I don't like that guy either, Jim. I didn't say I didn't like him. Well, you'd be surprised what a fellow like me finds out just keeping his eyes open. Jim, come over and talk to me. Sit down. How are you coming along? Well, I thought I was doing all right until Babs, well, turned from science to art. You're just like your father. He wasn't very smart where women were concerned, either. <laughs> it wasn't until he fell off the roof and broke his leg that your mother found out that she loved him. <laughs> Do you think that would help? <laughs> I don't think it's necessary. Most women, you will find, pick husbands who see the world pretty much as they do, who think as they do about, uh, Religion, war, politics, yes, even communism. They do it unconsciously. It's bred into them from childhood. Yes, but they can make mistakes, too. And they can also correct them if you give them a little time. I never knew time. had so much to do with love. <laughs> I don't understand what you mean exactly by abstract form, Nick. That's the trouble with verbal language. It's too clumsy to express elusive qualities. But to me, abstract form is the essential substructure. In short, the fundamental rhythm underlying our conceptions of spatial limitations. Do I make myself clear? Oh, oh, perfectly. It's very clear now. Thanks. Say, this weather's almost as good as Indiana's. Uh, don't get up. Uh, what do you got there, Mr. Magroff? One of your paintings? Yes, it's a work that I'm rather fond of. A good piece of abstract painting, don't you think? Uh, it, uh... Oh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's remarkable. Certainly got a lot of color. No doubt about that. What does it represent? Represent? Why, it doesn't represent anything. Why should it? It's a picture, an independent entity. There's no reason to imitate something else. No, no, I suppose not. It, 
It, it's just that I'm sort of used to looking at pictures of people and objects, uh, you know. Why? Uh, why? Well, it's, um, um, uh, uh, why? If you want a house or a flower, you can go and look at them. Or if you want them represented, you can have them photographed. So why allow them to intrude into pictures? Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Well, if you young folks will excuse me, I think I'll take these flowers in and put them in some water. I think they uh, need a drink. Dad's idea of fine art is rearing a two-fisted family. Too bad. He ought to keep up with the times. I meant to show you this before. What do you think of it? Oh, it, it's unique, all right. I don't think I've ever seen a ring like it. It's really a collector's item, a rare specimen of barbaric jewelry. It's been in our family for about 300 years. 300 years? Uh, notice its color. Why, it's a study in polychromatic harmony. It's beautiful, really lovely. Oh, no, Nick, I couldn't take a ring like that. Why, why it must be priceless. Don't be silly. I want you to have it. <laughs> no, please, I, I couldn't think of it, really. Just wear it for a while. There's no harm in that, as a favor. Oh, no. Now you're being provincial, Babs. Well, just for a week or so. How does it look? Now that you're wearing it, I can tell you. This ring has been for over a dozen generations the official seal of the truth in my family. Oh, I think the others would like to see it. Mother? Dad? It's too big to describe in a song or a sonnet. So dress yourself up in your best bib and bonnet. The Westinghouse man has a welcome upon it for you when you come to this fair. Well, thank you. Thank you. And now, the fourth winner in our Letters Home Contest, a very young man from Riverdale, Indiana. Dear old Indiana, garden spot of America, Mr. Bud Middleton. All right, this way, bud, and congratulations. Now, your prize-winning letter in the Westinghouse contest made all the judges sit up and take notice. <laughs> These are unusual judges, that's all they took. <laughs> well, let's see, you had all your family with you, according to your letter, so you wrote that letter to a pal of yours back in Riverdale, didn't you? Yeah, to Toby Parker, but I won't know how much of a pal he is until I get back home and find out if he's been dating my girlfriend. Uh oh <laughs> maybe you made a mistake writing to Tubby. Remember, he gets half of your money, you know. Well, that's okay, but I'm serving notice. That's as far as our sharing goes. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. But tell me, bud, uh, what are you going to do with your prize money? Well, I think I'm going shopping for parts to make a shortwave radio set. <laughs> there you are, folks, the boy of tomorrow. But no fooling, bud. Really, you, you wrote a mighty interesting letter. It described how the fair would look without the electrical contributions of pioneers like Westinghouse. Imagine a fair without electricity. Uh, the folks? Uh -huh. <laughs> Hello, folks. But I'm going to spare the, uh, the details that you went into in your letter, and suppose you just sum up what you said, huh? If it weren't for fellas like these Westinghouse engineers, what would this fair be like? Well, I don't think they'd be any fair. Well, that's fair enough, too, isn't it? And very much to the point. Thank you very much, Bud, for those kind words. But I believe our vice postmaster in charge of judges, our personable Miss Bennett, uh, has the verdict ready as to the grand prize, our double award for the best letter of this week's crop. Am I right, Miss Bennett? Yes, I have it here, Mr. Perkins. And who, may I ask, is the uh, lucky winner? The winner is Mr. Bud Middleton. Very good. <laughs> oh, boy, the jackpot. Electricity, here we come. <laughs> city of New York, the bigger it gets. It's the same as Main Street, back home. Only larger and busier. Well, maybe we can get what I need here. I wonder if they've got any new gags. <laughs> Oh, 
the spitting image or I'll eat your hat without salt. Uh, we might be wrong. And may I see the uh, box of rings in the middle of the window, please? Why, certainly. You can search the city, but you won't find a nicer piece of costume jewelry. Well, it seem all right, Grandma. That's a perfect copy of a ring in a Moscow museum. Is it very expensive? Well, I'll be very honest with you. It's worth more, but you can have that for two dollars. And at that price, I'm practically giving it away. I'll have a half a dozen, if you please. Why don't you let me fix these things, Miss Harrison? You know, Big Feet, that's my next to last husband. Big Feet say I make sandwiches that knock your eye out. That's why I'm doing them, Elvira. I have use for my eyes today. Huh. Ears is all you need if that fern gentleman's coming. He sure got a powerful tongue. Mr. Makarov's to be the guest of honor. Hello, Grandma. Hello, Elvira. Mm -hmm. Hey, you sure is daughter. My, my, my. You look lovely, dear. Anything I can do to help? Oh, I nearly forgot. You left your ring on my dresser. My ring? That means bad luck of some sort. Grandma, I've got my ring. Why, they're absolutely the same. Where'd this other ring come from, I wonder? I don't know. Hello, everybody. Can I help? Oh, what's the matter with you, Babs? Are you sick? No. No, I'm all right. Oh, I declare I think you'd lose your head if it wasn't glued on. Here, it's your ring. I found it on my dresser. What's wrong? Don't you want it? The very same. Why, they're all alike. Where'd you get them all, Babs? The land sakes alive. Do you know what this is all about, Mother? Me? How should I know, Jane? Come on, now. Take these sandwiches in and... And stop looking at me as if I'd stolen your purse. Should look pretty is beyond me. You won't even know I'm around. Where's my tobacco? Oh, Babs, you left your ring in the bathroom. You know, that's no way to treat a valuable ring like this. You might lose it. Say, how many of them have you got anyway? Too many. Hi, everybody. Is the eating commenced yet? I haven't had anything to eat in about four hours. Mm, food is good, but the service is awful. Oh, say, kid, just how many rings did that guy Nick give you? Was he in the jewelry business? Well, I found two of them in my room. Holy smoke, you got a million. <laughs> Good afternoon. Is Miss Barbara in? Yes, sir, Mr. Mako. There's all here. Come right in, sir. Just lay your head on the table there, sir, and follow me. <laughs> Mr. Mako. Good afternoon, Mrs. Middleton. Hello, bud. Mrs. Harrison. How are you, Mr. Middleton? Babs. Haven't you lost something? Young ladies shouldn't leave their valuables lying around. I found this on the hall table. Quite a study in polychromatic harmony. Don't you think? What? Why, the dirty crook told me there was only one of them. Don't worry about that. Give hey, a chance. Hey, let go of my arms. Will you get up? Hey, come on now. You gotta up. beat it, Nicky. So wild man, when he gets going, I can't hold him much longer. Sakes alive, who all done busted what? Have 
think you scared him, Dad. He didn't even wait for a chow. You want to be ashamed of yourself, Tom Middleton. What do you mean by carrying a gun? A gun? <laughs> Why, I don't even own a gun. It is that uh, practical joking son of yours. I'll have you know, Tom Middleton, he's just as much your son as mine. Well, <laughs> now that the guest of honor has departed, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? A whole table full of trail in front of us, and you ask, what are we going to do? <laughs> oh, I mean afterwards. Well, I know what Mother and I are going to do. We're going to take our shoes off and listen to the radio. Can't you listen to it with them on? <laughs> we can sit around the house when we get old. Tonight, we're going to look for a silver lining. Just 46 years ago this month, I was doing the same thing, watching the lights of a World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition at Chicago. That was the first American fair lighted by electricity. Yeah, and Jim's company furnished most of the lighting for it. We've come a long way since then. Say, Jim, did you hear about the dame asking when the keepers feed the lagoon? can't help it, Babs. I've got to talk. I... Please, Jim, not now. Just let me hold on to you. I wonder if the years ahead will be as bright as this. We haven't seen anything yet, darling. Why, all this is merely a sample of the real world of tomorrow. 